to the Clinical Podcast Series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. The topic for this episode is axial length shortening after orthokeratology and its relationship with myopic control. I'd like to thank our host, Dr. Dave Kading, our topical expert, Dr. Michael Lipson, and our lead topical editor, Dr. Andrew Pucker. And now it's my pleasure to begin today's podcast. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the uh, American Academy of Optometry Foundation clinical podcast series. We're joined by Dr. Michael Lipson. How are you today? Very well. How are you doing? Absolutely. I'm doing fantastic. My name is David Kading, and uh, we're excited to speak with Dr. Lipson about a paper called Axial Length Shortening After Orthokeratology and Its Relationship with Myopia Control, which was written by Wang. Um, Dr. Lipson, why is this topic uh, important for us as optometries? Give us a, you know, a short little uh, description of the, of the publication. I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic to discuss, but basically the authors uh, looked at changes in axial length short term after commencing ortho -K. And they found that some patients show an initial decrease in axial length during the first month after starting ortho -K. And this phenomenon they've observed in about 50% of the patients um, but the, the paper really didn't suggest on how you would predict, you know, which patients would or would not uh, show this effect. Hmm. So again, axial shortening immediately after starting ortho -K. Yeah, starting ortho -K, So this is after a what time period again? Like a month. Yeah. So, you know, I think in clinical practice, you know, this, this has some applications and it may be important for us to keep in mind as we're seeing patients. How would you say that's going to, you know, affect things for us optometrists clinically? Well, clinically, if you're measuring axial length and you are using that as a guideline to um, guide your treatment options, uh, if you see decreased axial length initially, it may uh, slightly overestimate the myopia control effect that you're having. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in 50% of the patients, that could be something to kind of keep in mind. Now, we don't know what happens in month two, three, four, or five. Maybe they'll report some of those findings, but that certainly will be interesting to keep our eye out. What, what you know, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say one of the things that they look for in the study is they divided these two groups, the ones who did show the shortening and the ones who did not. And they tried to analyze some of the differences. And um, one of the things that showed up is long-term, there was a slight statistically significant difference in terms of what they call the rebound effect after discontinuation of ortho -K. But the amount, even though it said that it was statistically significant does not seem clinically significant to mm. me. The mm -hmm. differences in terms of the amount of rebound was only 0 0.04 millimeters. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. but, now, but the overall, the overall axial length and axial elongation differences in the two groups after 20 months still showed that the group that showed that initial shortening was actually uh, better. They had less axial elongation in that group. So thinking anatomically, you know, about a shorter eye, can you, do they, do they hypothesize in the paper? Do they guess as to what is causing or do they measure what's causing the eyeball to be shorter? Well, their measurements are overall axial length measurements that they're taking with an IOL master or a lens star type device. And from the research that we have seen and we understand that the choroid is probably the source of that uh, with initial choroidal thickening during the uh, ortho -K process. Yeah. And this is a section, uh, you know, most of us in the contact lens cornea space think about the choroid 
zero times during the course of a month, right? <laughs> Most right. of us we're, are. We're, we're looking at focused. corneas and contact lenses on yeah. the anterior part yeah. of the eye. So. But a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of studies are coming out related to this posterior segment changes that are resulting. And I think we've got a lot to learn in this. Now, can you use the data from this paper in any way to predict who's going to get a clinically meaningful effect of ortho-K uh, for myopia management? When I read the paper, I was very excited about the possibility of learning you know, who would do this? You could predict ahead of time, but there's really nothing in the paper that would suggest one way or the other how you could predict this seeing a patient to start, whether they're going to be one of these ones who shows this initial um, axial shortening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else in this paper stand out to you? Obviously, really, really interesting. Um, you know, usually we look to myopia management to slow down the progression of the eyeball getting longer, but to actually see a shortening effect, if you don't measure that, you may artificially see, like you mentioned earlier, that the myopic progression uh, cessation is uh, over-exaggerated. Um, can you speak to anything else or speak to that further? I just think clinically, we have to continue to measure axial length. We have to compare it to baseline and we have to compare it visit to visit too, because, you know, if you're seeing uh, overall axial changes, axial length changes over time, it may guide your clinical decision-making. Um, but this may be if between say a six month and a 12 month visit. Yeah, yeah. Well, with newer devices coming on the market for axial length measurement, uh, you know, we've got auto refractors that do axial length. We've got mm -hmm. devices that are axial length alone, um, topographers that have axial length in it. I think as we uh, clinically see axial length become more and more and more readily available, this data is going to mean more and more and more to us as we just get it. I mean, think of the early days of the OCT. Yep. I mean, we learned about it from people who had OCTs way back when, but it just made way more sense as more of us bought OCTs and started Im implementing this into our practice. I think uh, really the important part of this paper, I, I don't want to totally discount it. I think it's very, very important actually to be aware of this potential of this effect, the potential that it's there and the potential that some patients will show it and some will not. And uh, just to be aware of it in taking your measurements, don't be surprised if you see an axial length, you know, after one or two or three months, that's less than your baseline. It, it's not because your instrument is off or your technician is not doing a good job. It, it very well could be that they're one of these reactive patients. Yeah, yeah. And we'll have to keep our eye out for more information on this rebound uh, effect and so forth. So very interesting stuff. Very interesting. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Lipson, for your review of this article. We sure appreciate your contribution to the Academy. Well, it's a pleasure being here. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for joining us for the American Academy of Optometry Clinical Podcast Series. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date with other great podcasts from our, uh, our, our great clinical team. Have a good rest of your day. And a special thanks to Cooper Vision for their educational grant to make it all happen.